Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for this workshop. Um, now, this workshop um, is enhancing your math tuition for small groups. And just a few housekeeping notes before we uh, properly get started. Um, you should be able to enable uh, closed captions if that is something that would be useful to you. There should be a button in the toolbar to allow you to do that. Um, and all comments and, and questions if you have any questions, and we do uh, ask you to pop them in the Q and A uh, function, and um, which also should be on your toolbar, it just makes it super easy for us um, to make sure we address any questions that you may have at the end. And we've got a Q and A uh, section at the end in order to do that. But anything you want to contribute chat wise, feel free to, to pop in in the chat box. But all questions will go in the Q and A section. And um, now we've had really fantastic attendance for our workshops uh, so far. So if you if if you weren't aware, we have um, run these as a series of workshops, and this is the fourth one that we have done. Um, and the, this particular workshop is subject specific, but the previous ones to this have been um, more general workshops, and one on focusing on building a positive tutoring environment, and then also um, running tutoring programmes in schools, which is more aimed at teachers, and then a more general how to deliver impactful tuition. If you missed any of those and you'd like to watch recordings of them, um, we have them all available on our website for you to do that. Um, we also have another workshop coming up on Thursday, which is more English focused, but it's less about English today and it is all about maths. Uh, so just a quick one about us. We have covered this before, so I will be brief. Um, we are a charity and, and we focus on serving young people across the country um, within, within small group tuition. Um, for us specifically, we recruit qualified teachers uh, to deliver this tuition and we have 10 years experience working with schools um, around the country doing this work. Now, with you today um, for this workshop is myself. Um, I am Talent Heads uh, Teaching and Learning Lead. We also have um, Sam um, Harvey Bruin joining us from Mesme, um, who will be speaking with you all a, a little later. Um, hi, Abby. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sam. We also have uh, Alex Flynn um, joining us and Taslima Hussein um, joining us, who are both teachers and tutors, um, and they will be uh, joining us in the form of a, a pre-recorded section that's going to be going into the particulars of um, some maths teaching and learning approaches as, uh, framed around small group tuition. So with the aims of today, math specific and I will be handing over the reins to those who are far more experienced um, talking about maths than I am but we really want to focus today on sharing approaches for starting tuition with groups who lack confidence in maths but also to demonstrate assessment for learning um, in, with learning particular teaching and learning techniques and how that can be applied in person and online. We're also going to talk about modelling maths and ensuring that all of your students have opportunities to contribute. And then we will discuss some platforms, tools and resources that you can use to boost interactive opportunities um, when you are tutoring maths. So first of all, and if you win one of our workshops before, you'll be old hat at this. Um, but there is a um, QR code on the screen. If you've got a smartphone next to you, do jump and use that to open up uh, the Mentimeter. And it's going to ask you whereabouts you're based and ask you to pop a pin on the screen um, to let us know whereabouts you are. If that function is just not, not available to you, um, please jump into the chat box to let us know whereabouts in the world or the country that you are, because it's really nice to know who we have got in the room with us. So jump in there and have a look. Ah, so I can see some pins coming up on the screen already. That's wonderful. Let's share that with you guys now. So we have got a uh, strong representation from the South here today, um, creeping up into the Midlands as well. Um, lots around London. Uh, somewhere up in the northeast, someone in Wales. Lovely, thank you very much. And um, we've also got some in Edinburgh, um, Herefordshire, Blackpool. Wonderful. So we've got a really nice spread uh, there today. Now I want to ask you something else as well. 
if we're thinking about um, the students that you often will have come into one of your maths groups, and this might be actually just your personal experience of tutoring maths for individuals as well, what would you, would you say is the best way to describe the students that you tutor? So you can choose more than one option here. And again, you should be able to just uh, jump and do this on your phone. This screen should have switched over. But is it students who lack confidence? Is it students who are low, low attainers? Those who are sort of that borderline grades, those who are high attainers, students with SEMD or students who are preparing for the 11 plus or the 13 plus. Um, OK, so this is a really interesting spread as well. Um, quite often students who lack confidence comes through and quite often we see students who are high attainers or have the potential to be and very high attainers, but who also lack confidence. That crossover is really common as well, isn't it? Um, and we have a spread of low attainers, borderline. Okay, interesting. So in terms of like targeting our tuition, we're seeing a lot coming through here. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so on to how we then might introduce approaches for targeting these particular students. Now, you'll be pleased to know, I'm sure, that when we're talking about um, students who lack confidence, low attainers, high attainers, and everything in between, the approaches that we're gonna talk about today are really useful for stretch and challenge opportunities, for accessing and uh, making maths accessible for low attainers uh, as, uh, as well. So what we are covering here, I'm sure will be able to be directly applied to some of your tuition sessions too. Now, I will be very brief about this. Now, this workshop is um, based on research that we have conducted this year. And I won't go over it into a huge amount of detail now, but if you would like to have a look at that research, um, it's all published and available on our website. And that's what all of these workshops are based, are based on too. And through this, we interviewed many tutors to build our knowledge of exactly what is happening in a tuition session that means that impact um, is made and progress is made over the course of your time with that group of students. So we'll be covering assessment for learning, catering to different needs in the same group, uh, a process that is referred to as getting the maths from then, so how to guide students to points of discovery, modelling for maths and online resources, and then we'll finish off with a QA. and a But first of all, I'm going to be joined by highly experienced tutor Alex Flynn. He's going to share his thoughts and insights into assessment for learning, particularly as a tool when planning sessions and adapting your content to cater to different needs within the same group. So over to uh, Alex for this. And with me now I have Alex, who is a maths tutor with Talented. Um, Alex is um, based in London and has been teaching and tutoring maths in London since 1994 in largely inner city based comprehensive schools. So with that, I will hand over to Alex. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to switch off the um, video. I've been asked um, to share um, specifically some of the work that I have used in the past at the beginning, or in, in particular at the beginning of a, a series of 15 sessions uh, with a, a small group of students. Um, now I'm going to talk about a starter activity uh, and I'm also going to add an extra part regarding how I use a, a similar method to the starter activity, um, but with an eye on assessment for learning, which is what I will be, uh, which is what I, do quite often during uh, the 15 sessions I spend with the students. So um, we want the students to leave the first session, as I said, eager to return. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I found if I use Corbett Maths, for example, which is uh, an easily accessed and very, very comprehensive online resource, uh, and many of you will may have or probably know it if i use a five a day from uh corbett maths i will maybe uh take a maybe foundation plus a foundation again it depends on the year group but i'll, I'll print out a couple of these and i will uh, cut out the topics and and hand lay them out flat on the table in front of the students um and then i'll ask the students to pick some questions um and and, and i'll say to them i would like you to teach this 
topic that you, the, the ones that you choose to the other students. Um, some students may choose one or two. Some students may be eager enough to choose four or five or, or as many as they possibly can. But initially, they will be interacting with each other. Uh, and hopefully, they will all have some uh, topics that they will have collected. There may be some left. There may be some that no one chooses. And what I will do then is I'll keep them for later. And if I have time at the end of the session, I may ask um, why the students didn't choose them. Uh, maybe they were too difficult, maybe they thought they were too easy. Any information that they give me or I gather is useful. Um, and if they're all silent, if they don't want to participate um, or they feel a little bit nervous, then I may use one of the ones that they've left over um, to model what I would expect. So I would choose one of the students, choose a card and then explain it to them and hopefully they could model uh, what I'm doing. Now, on the slide, uh, the student interaction slide, once they begin, <clears throat> I observe it's the, there's a tendency to interact with the students. At this point, I don't. I, I like to sit back and watch the individuals. Uh, I find this is a really uh, a useful time because I get to, especially with, with a lot of experience, I get to, I'm, I'm able to see uh, the ones who are confident, the ones who are nervous, the ones who uh, who can articulate particularly well, uh, or the ones who have the knowledge but are a little bit unsure about how to do it. Again, like any classroom, uh, you find out fairly quickly uh, information or uh, skills from the students. We are lucky when we're tutoring because we, you know, we have two, three, four students, and so we can really find out uh, about these students fairly quickly. I hope from the session. Um, if I move on to the next slide, um, once I've done the session and the students have explained or they've um, contributed to, um, let's say, the knowledge bank of, of the small group, then I'll take those uh, that information away um, and maybe in the future I'll do something similar. But what I've, what I've hoped that has happened at the end of that first session is that the students have seen me in a different light uh, from their normal classroom experience. Uh, there's been a bit of interaction. They've seen topics. I'm hoping that I haven't uh, made it too easy, but at the same time, I hope I haven't made it too difficult. And hopefully they will be uh, eager to return. As I said, I'm, I'm sharing that with you. There are obviously many methods. Uh, and many different ways to introduce yourself or, or um, to to the students, but this is just one method that I I like. I use others, but I, I do find this one to be particularly good. Um, now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I sometimes use uh, a similar method for assessment for learning, and so um, as I aim to use the sessions, obviously to uh, learn to enhance the learning experience, and sometimes. Um, I may be asked to cover a topic or sometimes um, I have to um, find one for myself and sometimes students uh, will tell the teachers or the teachers may think that they know it but they really don't so um, I've got I will have information at this point and uh, um, what I've done is again I've used Corbett Maths and uh, here's 1st of January a foundation plus five a day and for example say that I have discovered that they really are a little bit the students are unsure of solving two-step inequalities. In this case, it was 3x plus 4 is less than or equal to 22. They may uh, have become stuck. They may have, uh, there are many um, different scenarios for the students. They may uh, just uh, um, found it really difficult to explain to each other. So this is an example uh, of something. Uh, so what I will do with this topic, I'll unpick it. And I'll see how far they can enhance, uh, advance by themselves uh, once I have unpicked it and introduced it again to the students uh, with a more, uh, with, a, with an eye on assessing how much they know and how far uh, I can, um, I can move them forwards after they've hopefully understood um, the topic in a little bit more depth. So for the next slide, um, what I've done, what I generally do is I have a look at the curriculum content for inequalities. In this case, uh, I'm looking at the three, top three bullet points. These are in order uh, according to the curriculum. The first one, show inequalities and represent on a number line. So that's moving back a little bit. That's, that's what I call support. 
Uh, I just want to check their knowledge before. Uh, then there's the solving one and two step inequalities, which is what I'll call main. And if I, I'm thinking that if all goes well, then I may introduce them to solving inequalities with unknowns on both sides. So that's taking the algebra a little bit um, forwards. I think um, in the next slide, um, I've got my iPad, I've, I've come home and I've just scribbled down some questions. Um, and th these are my scribblings, you can see. Um, I've, so I've, I'm just thinking, I don't want to write too many questions. I just want to write where I think the students may find a little bit of a of a hitch and also I may I, I need to know what they know so for example for the first part um, the representation of inequalities I've just had a look at the closed circle the open circle do they remember that do they know this I wanted to sketch an inequality and then I, I want them to particularly this is important with GCSE and foundation level for example uh, when students have to state the range of numbers and also just a quick sketch on a number line for the linear equations uh, the base, the revised linear equations, uh, this is something I've added because I've thought if the students are not sure about inequalities, maybe it's the algebra, the solving linear equations, it's holding them back. So I've slotted that into the, uh, the inequalities content and I've, I've, I've added that. Uh, so, also, so I will be able to get a chance to um, see how well they, uh, what their skills are when it comes to solving uh, linear equations. I've also put on that an extension uh, with adding some brackets uh, and I just added some brackets and a term for the second part of the extension. Then uh, the main part, which is the one and two step inequalities, uh, we'll, uh, we're solving inequalities. If you notice the, uh, the, the equations are just, the inequalities are the same as the equations in most cases. Uh, I just want to show that there is almost no difference between solving inequality and solving uh, a linear equation. For the next slide, um, I've got, I have, uh, I've decided to add as an extension, uh, dividing by negatives or multiplying and dividing by negative numbers, particularly when uh, introducing or, or working with the students to show them what happens when the signs change. Uh, because as you know, if you divide by minus two, you've moved from uh, a, a just, just say a greater than becomes a less than, or if it's a greater than or equal than, becomes less than or equal than. Uh, so I want to show them, maybe drilling about why this actually happens, so I can get them to um, maybe list some uh, solutions to an inequality and then solve it and see if their solutions are correct. Uh, some students may um, be a little bit confused with this because they'll think they're correct but they're not and but this is where i uh drill in so i, th I found in my planning in advance that this will be part of my extension um again topic knowledge is really important this one and um you really do want to can you, i want to convey that there's that, that you can extend um this um the the last slide um once i've worked through this with the students. This is the things I'm going to think about. Will I use the topic um, as an exit ticket? So will I have a question in my mind to uh, give the kids before they leave the session, the students before they leave the session? Uh, shall I give them a topic list and get them or ask them to um, tick the boxes, say I have a column, an empty column beside the topic list and they can tick which ones they uh, feel that they've mastered um, and also this is quite useful if if I do give a list then I can use that list for the students to um, I can I can revisit that this in the future uh, with the students and also with talent ed at the end of the 15 sessions a summary we, we, write, we write a comprehensive summary about uh, the students and their learning so I can also mention um, these topics that will remind me especially if you have many students um, and then uh, maybe build a bank of these, so make this uh, a regular part of each session, so that at the end of the 15 weeks, then they can have a reminder of all everything they've covered. I can also introduce some to the school and I can give some back to Talent Ed. Huge thanks to Alex for sharing some insights there. Um, so 
Now I'm going to hand over to Sam, who is the Director of Curriculum at MISME, and he'll be discussing a few things in further detail. So over to you, Sam. Thanks, Abby. Um, yes, as I've said, I'm, I'm Sam Andy. I'm the Director of Curriculum at MESME, and, and we've been partnering with Talented uh, to deliver their Masterclass Tutorials programme, which, which is an instance of a MESME Math Circle programme. So um, this next section is, is called Getting the Maths from Then, which is a phrase that we use a lot at MESME, and, and the MESME mentors on the call will be very familiar with it. Um, what we mean by it is, 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 is the techniques and questions and prompts um, which tutors and mentors can use to help get the students to come in with the goods rather than, uh, rather than the tutor. Uh, it's, it's definitely not just leaving the students to it. Um, they, you know, there's a reason you're there and, and they need to be guided by your expertise. But it's about um, at times taking, taking the role of, of a guide and a facilitator rather than a lecturer when that's appropriate. Um, and in, in a measuring math circle, it, it most definitely is. Um, so before I hand over to Tazima with some examples of, of what it is, I just wanted to quickly share with you um, my favourite kind of example uh, from my own experience of, of, of what it's not. Um, and, and this is from one of the very first lessons that I learned as a, as a trainee teacher, in my first PGC placement, um, when I was very proud of myself for getting the maths from, from them. Um, when a student was struggling with uh, something like calculating 32 times 5. Um, so so I, I interacted with them, I had some dialogue with them. Um, I, got them to, I, I got them to do it, I got them to, to say something. I said, well, what's 30 times 5? Okay, what's 2 times 5? Okay, great. Add them together and you've got 32 times 5. Um, and, and I hope that some of you are, are giving a knowing kind of nod or giggle there because um, it's not really getting the mass from them. So they were definitely superficially involved, but the most difficult part of that problem was coming up with that strategy. And um, they were only doing each bits there. They were only doing um, the arithmetic. And so, so getting the math from them, I think it's really important that you, that, that, that as teachers, we, um, we reflect on whether we are getting the math from them or just the numbers. Um, and, and if we're just getting the, the numbers from them, there may be a very good reason for that. And that, that might be a, a, a great strategy at times. Uh, to model something and then to get them engaged or keep, keep them engaged by asking their arithmetic questions. Um, but it's not getting the math from them. So um, getting the math from them could be a lot harder. And I think there's a, there's a whole kind of toolbox of, of, of uh, possible frameworks for thinking and, and, and ways of generating the right questions to ask. Um, so without further ado, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand over to, to one of our excellent talented MESME tutors, Taslima. Uh, who's going to share some tricks and tips with you on how to do that. Um, with me now is Tasleem Hussein, who is a Math Masterclass tutor with Talented, and who describes herself as unapologetically nerdy, uh, and who loves to share her pas passion for maths with students. So with that, I will hand over to Tasleema. Hi, uh, thanks for that, Abigail. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so, yes, we're going to carry on with the theme of excellence um, in tutoring maths, and I'm just going to share the slides with you, and hopefully you'll find this a useful session and be able to take away some points that you can apply, whether it's in online tutoring or in-person tutoring. Um, Today's mini agenda, we're going to be looking at some different strategies that we can incorporate into our sessions just to help maximise engagement and get students reflecting on uh, the words they're using and the ideas that they are developing and how we can best support them in making progress. So. Um, <laughs> to start off with, um, we are going to look at bouncing, uh, bouncing questions, uh, looking at the how we can incorporate answers and misconceptions into our discussions, uh, non-examples, as well as focusing on mathematical vocabulary. Okay, so let's start off with uh, bouncing around. So what can bouncing around look like so i've got some examples here of questions um that i've done with students and how and i'm going to talk about how i incorporated bouncing around with these questions so bouncing around essentially it means sort of you know getting students answers and questions to feedback and inform other students answers and questions so 
<coughs> encouraging students to share alternative methods um, to their peers and to the group uh, can be a very sort of powerful tool. So for example, here um, in this question, about explain why all these multiplications must be incorrect now when doing this question with students for the first question um here some students spoke about um uh, spoke about parity and how if you multiply two odd numbers you would expect an odd number at the end in the ones column whereas other students um spoke about um, if you're doing a seven times a three, you would expect the ones column of the answer to include a one. So there were alternative methods that the students had. So when a student proposes an idea, it doesn't mean that we need to shut down all further ideas and contributions that students may have. We can continue to encourage whether any other student had an alternative method. Did anyone do that differently? How did you try it, George? How did you try it? Um, <laughs> Lois, you know, um, asking students to share alternative methods and encourage that there is still value in alternative methods, even if we have already found an answer. And then um, another form of bouncing around is to encourage students to build on top of ideas of their peers. So uh, if we continue with that question, there were some students who then um, use the idea of their previous peer uh, that we would expect this nine to be a one because uh, of the of the seven and the three when they're multiplied we'd expect that to be a one and they built upon the idea of their of, of their peer and and it can happen <coughs> in uh, in more complex ways as well and more um and, and it can take various shapes and forms but encouraging students to bounce around to build on top of what their peers have already shared and even sometimes directly referring to the fact that oh um, Amina made this point um, and and how, how did that affect your thinking how did that impact your answer uh, and letting them <coughs> share in that collaborative nature that maths can have maths doesn't have to operate um in independence that um and we can encourage that by directly referencing what other students have done and encouraging students to also reference and build upon the work of their peers um i also find um another um a quite a useful form of bouncing around that can take place is getting students to correct each other and reach a collective conclusion before intervening so it may be that a student <coughs> might make a mistake um and before immediately intervening and saying right you know um bob that answers are not correct um because you've made this mistake in a group setting where there's only a few students uh, especially i think it can be nice to ask other students do you agree do you disagree so keeping the the questions open and not leading them down a particular path but allowing them to almost negotiate with each other and justify their conclusions um to reach uh, <coughs> that collective conclusion of what the answer is now it might be now it certainly happened to me that the collective conclusion that they reach is still not correct um, and then you can continue to have that discussion about about um about these ideas and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a further slide about misconceptions um but yes you know um justifying it it's, it creates that skill of articulation and develops that further because they're justifying to each other how they reach the <coughs> reach the conclusion and someone with their same math or a similar mathematical understanding needs to be able to follow their explanation meaning that they have to be more concise with their words so <coughs> bouncing around ideas between students and as a group can help with them develop that precision um and another sort of um uh, strategy uh, for bouncing around is encouraging students to justify the conclusion that someone else has made and it's a, it's an added bonus in the sense that it checks that all students are listening to each other uh, because if you say George what did Kai just say um, and if uh, jo or, or, or can you justify what Kai just explained well if you <coughs> if George is not listening very well then he won't be able to but if that's a common strategy that you use in your sessions then students will have to consciously make sure they're always engaging um, in other people's explanations and and contributions in order to make uh, justifications so bouncing ideas around from one student to the other um, <coughs> can be really valuable and help develop those contributions and engagement so um or and um so if you look at this example here these two students have drawn um <coughs> have drawn um networks and they and they look slightly different um in the sense that um 
uh, they've branched slightly different and um, but uh, that that's a discussion point differences um, are a form of, of discussion that we can bring up when we're bouncing between two students um, okay right moving on to the next um, topic so like I said um, with the previous slide we would talk, we're going to talk a little bit more about valuing incorrect answers and misconceptions. Um, so uh, it links in with bouncing. Um, talking about incorrect answers and misconceptions, it allows for bouncing around and facilitates that peer discussion. <coughs> and and as tutors or going into a session, whether online or in person, reflecting on where misconceptions may occur and what they will be, um, it can be a really valuable insight into planning your sessions um you know in my teacher training my te uh, the professor would always say do the questions before you deliver them and, uh, and by doing the questions it helps you see where those points of misconceptions and where those triggers um, are likely to be and it can plan your follow-up questioning and your follow-up explanations um if you can sort of visualize where a student may likely <coughs> be able to uh, likely struggle or make a mistake um and you know misconceptions are very valuable because um if one student has it it might be that more than one student has it in the group or perhaps even the other all the students have or share this misconception so it directs your planning in your discussion so finding misconceptions and determining what they are and using strategies to <coughs> to pull out misconceptions uh, can be really valuable in directing your tutoring in a more powerful way. And that's why we can try and create opportunities for students to make mistakes and misconceptions and use this as a learning tool. So for example, <coughs> in this uh, top question here, uh, now uh, there was a student um, who was tackling this question and uh, they simply, uh, weren't able to sort of understand how to tackle the problem because they had confused themselves on what the definition of a square number was um and so and so highlighting that misconception um and getting another student to bounce off and explain what a square number was meant that they could then easily tackle and complete that question so a misconception or a mistake they made that mistake um i asked them to make a contribution they incorrectly answered the question and it was clear that the source of that answer was um not understanding the definition of a square number that we were then able to rectify so exploring the source oh sorry uh, exploring the source of a um exploring the source <coughs> of a misconception also allows you um to see where the confusion stems from and how you can then overcome it and, and enable the student to continue forward with the problems so um you know uh, another sort of slight bit on how we can create opportunities for students to make mistakes so um down here for example there are uh, some <coughs> a decreasing sequence um with negative nth term and when students are working out the nth term for a negative sequence you know for example this one would be what is it? it's a minus n um plus uh, 20. Now, common mistakes that students could make um, when answering such a question is they might uh, put the 20, make the 20 negative, or they might um, not put a negative on the n at all, uh, or they might feel like this 20 minus n is a completely different answer. For seeing these um, possible misconceptions and creating opportunity to opportunities to discuss them so it could just be as simple as um what are the possible answers to this nth term or what is the answer to this nth term for this sequence and if you list the options including ones that are common mistakes you will see which students have a confident and clear understanding of the of the method and the strategy and the maths and which ones are perhaps um still holding some misconceptions and, and then this can be addressed in your planning and in your further discussions so it's always you know important to reflect on how you first react to mistakes so if a student makes mistakes and you're like oh no that's wrong okay this is how you do it um or, or that's wrong no this student is correct 
we're not embracing the mistake. If you embrace the mistake and um, accept it as a learning tool for not just, you know, a learning tool for all the students and a teaching tool for you, it can be a really powerful thing. But the students need to feel like it's a safe environment to make those mistakes and to share misconceptions. So reflecting on how you first react to mistakes um, it, it sort of contributes to how powerful those discussions on misconceptions and mistakes can be. Um, <coughs> so another sort of some examples to run through with you. So um, here we have two statements um, that, uh, that you'll be able to read. And, you know, the students that I had, some said that A and B are equivalent statements. Um, and then we had a discussion uh, when we looked at C and D and then they realized actually no, they're not equivalent statements and we talked about the misconception and what is the difference between a and b and then we spoke about sort of um the converse statements and how going in the forward direction is not the same as reverse so letting students make mistakes um it gives them that sort of cognitive uh, that feeling of when you make a mistake and you then learn from it sometimes can be more powerful than just being told right don't make this mistake so letting them make the mistake or similarly with this question um there are two possible values for d now um some students may sort of immediately sort of say there's only one possible value because if this um was a seven then seven times seven is 49 and i can't have a five right here in this particular question now um the students then are not thinking about um <laughs> possible carry-ons from the units multiplication and things like that so um getting students to reflect on contributions that you know the other columns made um so they've and you know it could be a shared misconception that they all think that that's the only option um but getting them to pull back and talk about okay what else could impact the sum and then they will then make a more long-term connection to the fact that okay right in future i need to focus more on whether they could be um, something that is carried on into the next column, for example. Uh, <coughs> um, and that, again, is a very powerful learning tool if they make the mistake and then learn from it. Okay, um, another um, strategy that you can use in your tutoring and your in-person sessions is reflecting on non-examples. Uh, what does this look like? Well, when possible, it's not always possible. It's encouraging students to not just to explain why something does work, but also reflecting on why um, alternatives or other solutions have been ruled out and why those do not work. So in this um, question down here at the bottom, um, <coughs> students <coughs> will begin by deducing that A has to be one, two or three because of the limitations of the thousands column. And then they might deduce um, that actually A has to be two because all multiples of six are even. Now they need to justify that um, and they need to reason out those conclusions and there there are then two possible options for B here and what the students need to do is not just talk about why this option does work they need to stop and reflect on why an option does not work because exploring ideas helps them determine the boundaries of concept why is something working and why is something else not working so similarly <coughs> in a more sort of straightforward example here just uh, on the definition of sort of polygons and things like that um giving clear non-examples to um to compare against provide students with boundaries um of of their problem so it can also be effectively used to address misconceptions um and it works very well with not just definitions but also mathematical concepts so here we have um, a problem involving quotients and remainders now um a non-example you know the student has to uh, has to think about the fact that six times um times something plus three has to they have to fill in those gaps so they they might realize well uh, actually the you know what limitations do i have here in terms of uh, of sort of um answers uh, could i you know um and so thinking about what doesn't work and what does work <coughs> can be can help them explore ideas and um, think about them in a more complete way because they realize what the boundaries of those of that topic um or that idea or definition is uh, and uh, the final 
sort of topic um, or point that I'd like to touch upon is how we can support the correct use of mathematical vocabulary. So what does this look like? Uh, it involves modeling the correct use yourself. Um, and students will learn from the example that you set. So not just um, using it once, but almost beating it to death, um, repeatedly using the words in the current lesson and subsequent lessons and using that precise language. And also drawing attention to the fact that you are using the correct terminology. I've used the word quotient here. I could have said this and that, but I've used the precise language quotient, drawing attention to students' correct use of language as well and celebrating that. Um, because correct use of mathematical vocabulary, it can facilitate understanding. And the final uh, point about um, supporting correct use of mathematical vocabulary is to sort of create a verbal fill the gaps. So to give students an opportunity to fill in that gap and fill in the definition where you haven't said it so for example you might be like what is the word what's the language that we use when we're referring to this particular so if you look at this example down here what's what's the word that we can use to refer to that number there and to this number here um, pull out the language from them and give them an opportunity to use that language and to recall that language and just one final point before we hit the summary is I just wanted to share a quick top tip on uh, Jamboard, particularly for those of you who are tutoring online. Um, you can screenshot, so Jamboard um, is available um, and you'll be able to find it if you Google it. And a little tip to help um, deliver your sessions more smoothly and to maximise um, student interaction is you can take a screenshot by pressing the Windows Shift S button um, of a particular slide or worksheet that you have and if you put a post it with a student um, can then click on it and fill in their name you also have the option of just clicking on that toolbar there and then duplicating um, the slide as so and then each student has their own slide with the worksheet on and then they can just fill in their name and, uh, and answer the questions and sometimes underneath a post-it you can put a little clue to a question if you feel like there's perhaps a common misconception that might occur or something or if it's a particularly difficult question particularly difficult question that they can then um, refer to afterwards um, and so back to our summary so um, <coughs> whether tutoring online or in person what we want to do is we want to create a positive environment where students can feel comfortable contributing and embracing mistakes it's all about the safe environment that we can create that will then allow us to facilitate bouncing around of questions um, to use misconceptions and answers as learning tools and to pull out um, articulation and explanations for using non-examples so just students really understand the boundaries of the maths that they're working with and um, modeling that correct use of mathematical vocabulary and really all of this is about sharing the maths that you love um, and pulling that maths out of them by creating that sort of working um, together that unison um, in your little tutoring sessions um, so thank you very much um, and that was me uh, Anna apologetically nerdy Slima. Thank you so much Taslima. that was so useful and full of things that I'm sure our tutors are going to be able to to take away in their sessions in the future. So thanks again to Taslima for um, sharing her insights there. Um, now we're going to jump to a Q&A now. I know we're at um, 10.45 but we are going to sort of stick around for another five minutes or so. Um, but just before we do that, um, a reminder that we have another workshop coming up on Thursday. It's English focused, maybe relevant to you because I know that some tutors do do multiple subjects or maybe relevant to somebody that you know. So do send them our way. And now Sam, who uh, is, has joined us today from Mesme, also has some additional screen shares um, from interactive whiteboards that um, he can share with us now. If, um, if that's of interest, do let us know in the Q&A box if you would like to see some additional examples here. Um, and you should be able to jump into that Q&A um, button now and um, to ask some questions and we will do our best to answer them and of course Sam is here for the math expertise. Uh, so we've got um, a question here from Antonia. Um, are there any specific programs that you must or shouldn't use? Um, now I'm going to assume that you mean programs as in 
um, online sort of like external uh, sites that you may be jumping around, but do just jump in and correct me if I'm if I'm wrong there. Um, it's a really good point that Sam and I have both uh, discussed. And when you are considering using a online platform like Jamboard or um, Mentimeter, like the one that we shared earlier, it's really important to to, to look at safeguarding implications. Um, we at Talented have a guide for questions that you should be asking when looking at um, a programme to use in your sessions. And one of the main things is, one, does it require the students to make an account to log in? If it does, it's one to be avoided. And two, through you in, um, asking the students to use a particular programme or platform, are, is their contact information going to be visible in any way? So, for example, Jamboard and Sam jump in if I'm if I'm not correct here. Um, but students can join that anonymously. You don't see their see their um, details at all. They can't see yours. So it, that's something to, to to make sure that you're testing um, is in contact information visible, do they require an account to log in? Um, and is this site specifically for um, a younger audience or not? And to make sure you've really tested that yourself before you encourage students to jump on there too. So I hope that answers your question. So again, any other questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. But Sam, I think it might be uh, a nice idea for you to share some of those um, examples that we were talking about earlier and um, just let me know if you've got the screen share function and if not I can jump in and sort that out for me. Yeah yeah um, Abby was just um, asking me if if I could um, demonstrate a little bit in a little bit more detail how to use a couple of the um, the, the whiteboard online whiteboard um, options out there um, and, and you know I'm I'm very much up for, for find what works for you and stick with it um, so I'm I'm quite team Jamboard, uh, but the thing is that they do offer different things, and and I think it's, it's good to be flexible as well, and to think about what you what you need for the for the group that's in front of you and for the task that's in front of you. Um, what's great I think about Jamboard is that it is is just super simple to set up, super simple to use. Um, so I will press share my screen. Can you see? my yes uh you can see the jamboard here can't you uh i can see cahoots cahoots and whiteboard that fi whoops that's the one i meant to share uh here jamboard perfect <laughs> there we go so it, here's the jamboard homepage where you'll see your recent jams and things you can add one it's not in the best place actually it took a while to find this button um but the plus button at the bottom right um gives you an option to start a new Jamboard um, and what I can do is um, well I'll I can I can share it with my duties uh, can you see that pop up well Abby yeah good all right uh, and I'm going to do that just by copying a link um, but before I, I do that I will need to um, give everyone access to it and once I've given everyone access to it I also need to make them an editor because otherwise all they can do is is see what's there they won't be able to kind of interact with it as a, as a um as an online whiteboard so i'm going to send that to abby in this uh in the zoom chat um and our we should be able to see when she joins us on the google down board of course you can prepare anything you'd like on this on these slides before you share that link um and there we go, and it comes up as anonymous wombats. You're a wombat today, Abby. How do you feel about that? Could be happier. Could be happier. Okay, right. Well, you, you got lots of different animals, but today it's wombat. Um, and some some of the some of the nice features. I mean, I think uh, Talzim already mentioned how you can really easily just copy and copy and paste things in um, images or or slides that you've that you've created. Um, you know, you could literally um, have your entire slide deck from a PowerPoint presentation on here and go through it like a PowerPoint, but students can draw on it. Or you might want to just snip a particular problem. Um, as you mentioned, how you can duplicate slides and, and get lots of people working on, on different on different slides. It's worth noting that it's not private, as in it's not private to each other. So uh, if you're working with a group, um, I think it's a, it's a huge benefit in a lot of ways. They can see each other's work and it kind of, it kind of uh, replicates what you get in the classroom when um, when students are 
uh, uh, sneakily look over to each other's answers, which in a test can be terrible. Um, I think in a learning environment, it's actually a really, really good thing. They can share ideas and, and look at what each other are doing. Um, and you might want to actively encourage that and say, everyone come over to slide three and have a look at what, have a look at what Antonio has done. A um, uh, couple of things that are, students find useful. Obviously, most students are, are not going to have a um, graphics tablet. Uh, and a lot of people, uh, uh, a lot of people talk to me about, about as, a, as, a, as, a, as a way to say, therefore, we can't use online whiteboard. I don't think that's the case. In my experience, I, I've got a trackpad here, and I'm not practiced at this. But some of my students really are, and they can actually they can actually use their trackpad pretty well. Let's see how I do. Um, I mean, pretty terrible, let's be honest. But in order to communicate small ideas, trackpad and, and mouse is, is is perfectly good. Um, and also, there are things like sticky notes. You know, you can type ideas here. Um, more damn, blah 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 blah, blah whatever. Um, sticky notes are great, and um, for a long time I didn't use uh, Jamboard for a few things because I thought there wasn't a straight line tool, because there's no straight line tool on the toolbar. It took me ages to, to find out that uh, it's just the pen tool, but you just hold down shift when you're drawing, and it will draw a straight line for you, um, which is really helpful in loads of uh, geometry work that you do. Um, anything, anything else do you think, that, Abby, that people want to to see or well, I think that's a really good um, foundation for, for people who may perhaps are unfamiliar with Jamboard going forward but um, we will be sending around um, feedback uh, form for this session uh, if there is the appetite for a more in-depth workshop on exactly using these kinds of things for your sessions do let us know in, in there because that would be really handy for us um, Dee has asked though um, are all students working on the same slide the flexibility is there for you. That's the thing. They can see all the slides. So, so um, I, I, Abby, would you be able to? I mean, I, actually, there's, there's not really much point in you sharing sharing the screen because it, it it is the same view as a student. And and um, and there you go. There's there's Abby saying hello. Um, and Abby can can move between these slides as well. Um, so it doesn't have that feature of kind of individual whiteboards that no one else can see, where you can use it for AFL and things like that. Um, I'd suggest whiteboard.fi for something like that, or keep it low tech. And, and if, they, if it's something typeable, just keep it in the Zoom chat. You know, don't don't overcomplicate things. Um, low tech is often the easiest thing. Um, and if you and if you're familiar with with polls on 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 Zoom, that can be a useful thing too. But again, why not just tip, stick it in the chat? Um, mm -hmm. You can, I think, um, I mean, you, you can change the options on 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 Zoom chat so that um, what students type. Is visible so that they can. Sorry, what students type is visible to everyone or just the mentor. Um, am I right in, in thinking, Abby, that, that on 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 talented Zoom accounts they can do that as well? Yes, that's choose. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you want it to be an AFL point where they can't blurt out to everyone, but just to you, you can change those options so that they they can't for that mm -hmm. activity. Mm. And if you want to use a Jamboard and you want to assign particular slides to people, Teslima does this a lot as well, where she'll kind of create slides and use post-it notes to let students know which slide that they should be working on. So if you're thinking of assigning, again, it's a low tech way that's probably the most straightforward of way of assigning slides to particular students. But thank you so much for your, for your questions there. Um, and again, do let us know if, if this is something that you would like a more in-depth workshop on, because uh, Sam is the Jamboard um, expert <laughs> <laughs> that I know anyway. Um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so um, with that said, um, we will finish up today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you'd like to join our session on Thursday, please do. All of our recordings of our previous workshops are up on our website and look out for the feedback form, which will be coming around shortly. Um, so we'll, what we'll do is um, we'll close the session now. But if you do have any particular questions about um, us as an organisation, um, then feel free to just stick around in the chat and I will uh, let you um, speak to you there. But with that said, um, thank you very much for joining us and have a lovely uh, rest of your term um, and sessions wherever they may be with us or otherwise and a lovely rest of your day thanks for joining and thank you so much to Sam from Mesme for joining us today as well thanks for having me thanks a lot <laughs>